So this is the uh, Endocrine Fellows Foundation preceptorial. This is day four uh, of our two-week uh, program. And uh, this will begin a four-part series on a discussion that has to do with osteoporosis, picking up some threads of what you already heard and anticipating areas that you will learn more about in detail. Uh, uh, we will cover uh, the subject in, in pretty good detail. So uh, we are ready to go. And uh, the first point is that obviously osteoporosis is a uh, disease for all people, all ages, and all countries. It's really a global problem. And this is uh, some data um, that kind of gives you the projections of where uh, the field was uh, a while ago and where it's projected to be. And looking at this uh, map of the world in pink are the projections of hip fractures uh, compared to the estimates uh, would have, which would have been 100 years before. And you can see every region of the world is showing marked increases in the incidence uh, of hip fracture. And the worldwide uh, prevalence of osteoporosis is estimated to be about 200 million. And you'll appreciate that um, this is not just a disease of older people. It depends on what you define as older. I mean, most of you think 60 to 70 is older, but believe me, it isn't. <laughs> Um, and even um, 70 to 80 is not that old. I saw a patient a couple of days ago who's 80 years old, and he told me he swims uh, 1.2 miles every day in 35 minutes. If that's true, I mean, those of you who swim will appreciate that's really clip. It's going at a clip. He's 80 years old. He looks like he's 60, and maybe this is true. So age is relative, and um, obviously it's a disease of older people, but not old people. Uh, and uh, an estimate of 30%, um, maybe even an underestimate in terms of the uh, proportion of women uh, over the age of 50 who have evidence for one or more uh, vertebral fractures. So here are more projections, kind of the same data, but it makes um, uh, another point uh, that of those six million projected hip fractures uh, that will be uh, s s experienced throughout the world by 2050, uh, about half of them will be in Asia. Now, Dr. Walker talked to you yesterday about the interesting protection, relative protection, uh, we think, afforded by Chinese uh, and maybe other Asian people. Um, by virtue of maybe a genetic disposition to have better microstructure of bone. Uh, and that may play out to a, a relative lower risk, but there are so many people in Asia that the total number uh, is certainly very uh, uh, impressive. Uh, and also um, bear in mind that um, there are some data suggesting that the secular epidemiology of hip fracture is declining a little bit. Uh, it isn't exponentially going up as we thought it would be, but it is still climbing. So interesting demographics here, but still this disease is not going away uh, by any means. And in fact, it will be continuing to be a problem throughout the world. Now in the US, uh, obviously we have an issue. And these are data from our own National Osteoporosis Foundation and the Surgeon General's report of a few years ago. And uh, this gives you numbers of osteoporosis and low bone density. So the osteopenic group and the osteoporotic group are put together in one uh, graph. And you can again see that the projections, uh, you know, right now um, somewhere between 40 and 50 million and uh, maybe uh, even more in the next 10 years. So again, looking at the US, um, there are approximately 2 million osteoporotic fractures that occur every year. Uh, and the lifetime risk uh, of a typical 50-year-old Caucasian woman in this country uh, in terms of a fracture by the age of 80 is about 40 to 50 percent. And those fractures are um, divided into the big three. Uh, 
Uh, the big three being vertebral compression fractures, hip fractures, and uh, non-vertebral fractures aside from hip, and those are typically the uh, forearm fractures. <clears throat> and again, looking at this lifetime risk on the left is that 50% figure. And uh, it's a comparison not to, not to in any mean means to diminish the importance of breast cancer. Obviously, breast cancer is a big deal. But in terms of risk, uh, the risk of, a, of an osteoporotic fracture is much greater than the risk of breast cancer. And in men, uh, the risk of an osteoporotic fracture is somewhat greater than uh, a male uh, risk of, of prostate cancer um, lifetime. So this uh, a uh, statement was made to me uh, when I was in Armenia last October by uh, Nurina Mamakoyan, who is the, uh, one of the principal figures in the bone world in Armenia. And um, she said uh, this, and I thought it was worth uh, remembering. Um, osteoporosis is one of the most dangerous diseases of the 21st century. It isn't just a broken bone. It has many, many consequences. So here's a picture of a woman uh, who was sitting on a park bench. And uh, a couple of things about her. Um, she's sitting on a park bench. Uh, why is she sitting on a park bench? Because it's easier to sit than to walk around. Uh, mobility is uh, compromised in many of these individuals. Uh, you'll notice that she's not obese, and she'll never get obese because her abdominal contents have been pushed forward by her thoracic compression fractures. So she doesn't have a capacity to eat that much. For every uh, thoracic compression fracture, it has been estimated that vital capacity uh, drops by about 9%. So at its end, someone with multiple thoracic fractures could have pulmonary compromise. And again, you can imagine her trying to get comfortable in bed. Um, not easy. Uh, and the survival data are pretty clear. She will not live as long um, as her non-osteoporotic and otherwise uh, matched counterparts. Now, uh, if I had a pointer, I would point out, but I can point out with my finger, and you can see, that um, she's just had her hair done. And if the lights were down, you could see that she's wearing lipstick. And she's wearing uh, heels. Now, what does all this mean? <laughs> well, it means to me that she is attempting to look as what she wants to look. She wants to look as well as she can. And uh, you look at her, and she looks at herself in the mirror, and she, doesn't seem, she does not see the same person that she used to be. So this is a disorder that really robs um, women of their self-esteem. And don't forget the men. Uh, and we're going to talk about male osteoporosis next week. But this is a disease of men, too. And the data in this country um, breaks down that demographic of osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, into male, female. And you can see we're talking about 10 to 12 million men in this country um, who have either osteoporosis or osteopenia, about one quarter of the total population of osteoporotics. All right, so what is this disease? Uh, here's a, a way of describing this disease in a picture and a way of describing this disease in words. So let's take the pictures uh, first. Um, these are actually from our own um, um, experience. Um, the uh, biopsies uh, were taken by us, and uh, the micro CT is by David Dempster. Uh, who you will meet next week. Uh, and these pictures are actually in the Smithsonian uh, as the descriptor of what is osteoporosis. And so we can start by saying there's less bone. Obviously, in the top panel, there's less bone than in the bottom panel. And the second piece of this descriptor, by the way, that's what Fuller Albright said in 1940, too little bone. And that's what osteoporosis is. But, of course, there's more than that. Look at the top panel. Look at the microstructure. Um, the middle uh, part of that panel is a, a trabecular strut that's about to be broken. 
And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a strut that's completely broken. Um, so this is a skeletal disorder of microstructural uh, deterioration. Now, the word definition was offered by the NIH Consensus Development Conference uh, about 15 years ago. And it, it was a subtle but important change from earlier word definitions of osteoporosis. The current definition, a skeletal disorder uh, characterized by compromised bone strength predisposing to an increased risk of fracture. And the, the underscore bone strength is the key but subtle difference, as opposed to saying a disease of reduced bone density. Uh, there's more to this than just reduced bone density. And I think this definition is pretty good. Um, it, it is a disorder of bone strength based upon um, microstructural disease. Okay? So, uh, there's a pathophysiology of osteoporosis, and in order to really appreciate the full scope of the pathophysiology, we have to get into the world of pediatrics. Uh, and the first bullet is pediatrics, failure to accrue peak bone mass. And then there is age-related bone loss. We're all going to experience age-related bone loss. Some of us will experience accelerated postmenopausal bone loss. And then there's a whole host of other conditions that can add to aging and menopause um, and even make the osteoporosis worse. Okay? So let's start with peak bone mass. The failure to achieve peak bone mass is an important element in the pathogenesis of the disease. That is a worthy uh, concept. A major consequence in adulthood of poor skeletal health in childhood is osteoporosis. So let's think about this. Uh, in childhood, we are accruing our bone mass. And you can see by this slide, uh, the major increase in bone mass, well, bone density, but it's bone mass also. And there seems to be a, um, uh, a little uptick in the years 10 to 15, which reflects uh, an accelerated period of bone gain, probably due to menarche uh, uh, and uh, adrenarche. So when six, six steroids kick in, you're going to get a, a somewhat increase in the accrual of total bone mass and bone density as defined by, bone, by DEXA, that is grams per centimeter squared. And how, how long does this go on? Does, uh, do we continue to accrue bone mass um, beyond the age of 20? Uh, and that's probably true, um, but somewhere, and it's probably variable, uh, somewhere between the early 20s and the early 30s, <laughs> um, we're going to reach our peak bone mass. So all of you are kind of at the end of your run. <laughs> probably you've already gotten there, I would say. Uh, and then for the next 10 or 20 years, you're going to maintain what you've gained uh, and then things are going to go downhill, not just in terms of your bone mass, but in terms of a lot of other things, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay? So the, the, the concept is to accrue as much skeletal mass as you can, uh, when you, when can when you can accrue skeletal mass. So what are the factors that lead to this uh, point? And uh, genetics, of course, are very, very important. And I don't know whether Doug is going to talk about this, but um, the genetics of bone mass accrual may constitute 60 percent, some people think maybe up to 80 percent, um, based on your genetic makeup. Um, and we don't know what that means, but we certainly know clinically what it means. It means um, family history. And when you see patients with osteoporosis, you'll 
always want to know about mother, father, sister, brothers, cousins. Um, where, is there a genetic disposition as in, in terms of a uh, family history? And we have identified some genes that may be important with regard to this. There are high bone density phenotypes. Um, uh, certainly the uh, individuals with rare diseases of sclerostin deficiency uh, present with high bone mass and maybe there's something there but uh, there clearly is a genetics and, and it's a major determinant. Nutrition, calcium, vitamin D, protein, um, to name a few, in, uh, nutrients are really important um, in childhood. Body size, body weight, exercise, smoking, and sex hormones are all important. Okay, so here is a cartoon uh, that we'll revisit a few times. And A is the person uh, who has achieved optimal peak bone mass. So let's, let's distinguish between peak bone mass and optimal peak bone mass. Everybody reaches peak bone mass. You know, we're all gonna have, reach, we all have reached peak bone mass. But is it optimal peak bone mass? Is it as good as you can be, given all the circumstances of your genes and your life, are you going to be A or are you going to be B? And if you're B, um, you're not going to be as well endowed with skeletal mass as you would be if you were A. And given that the strongest predictor of bone density in older age is your bone density at younger age, it stands to reason that we would like the Bs to become A's if at all possible. Now, it's possible uh, that there are C's, that is, youngsters, who are not going to come close to A. They're going to be, and even not close to low normal peak bone mass, they're going to be uh, behind at the very beginning. And this, uh, we don't know, you know, this is all conceptual. Um, small size leads to low bone density, but that may be an artifact. Uh, heredity we've talked about and issues with regard to sex steroids may be important in terms of the C group. And obviously if we could identify those children, we might be able to do something to get them up to B. And you know, again, ideally you'd like to do even, even better. Okay, so uh, I thought this would be kind of interesting to talk to you. I saw a patient yesterday and uh, by the way, we're having case discussion this afternoon and I don't know whether we'll present this this afternoon. But anyway, it's an interesting uh, problem. Um, and I need your help on this. A 53-year-old Caucasian woman, I saw her yesterday at four o'clock. Uh, strong family history of osteoporosis. Mother and father are both still alive. They're 89 years old. Uh, mother has had fractures, father has not. Um, no hip fracture, but other fractures. Um, uh, she doesn't actually know whether they're on medication. She thinks one of them may be. Uh, uh, she has a sibling who uh, may also have osteoporosis, but she's not sure. She had her menopause two years ago, the age of 51, um, and she uh, did not take estrogen, didn't even consider estrogen because she has a very strong family history of breast cancer. She's a G1P1. She has a 13-year-old teenage girl uh, who is healthy. She herself has uh, not had any fragility fractures. She had a traumatic elbow fracture uh, about 15 years ago, falling down a set of stairs. No other obvious risk factors, no secondary causes that I could determine. But she had a bone density done. At the, uh, at the, in January, six months ago. And I asked her, why did you get a bone density? And she said, well, because of my family history. Okay? So here's the bone density um, that was done elsewhere. And it showed the lumbar spine T-score of minus three. Total hip, minus 1.1. Femoral neck, minus 2.1. Distal radial bone density is completely normal. 
And her labs, as such as I have them at the moment, <clears throat> her chem screen was normal, her serum calcium was normal, 25D was 51 nanograms per ml, normal, PTH was 23 picograms per ml, normal, phosphorus was 3.5 milligrams per deciliter, norm, normal bone turnover markers. Somebody drew bone turnover markers. Can you believe that? And uh, they were normal. Her CTX was 274, her osteocalcin was 19. And she also had a celiac screen, which was negative. So, is this postmenopausal bone loss? My first question for you. I need help on this. She's postmenopausal, T scores minus three. Bone turnover, well, they're not low, but they're, they're low. bone turnover markers are normal. But she's postmenopausal. But she's two years postmenopausal. So, can you just think about this? Can you go from a normal T score? I don't know what her T score was two years ago, but can you go from a normal T score to a lumbar spine T score of minus three in two years? You can, but it's, you've got to have something really wrong with you. <laughs> Not postmenopausal. You're not going to go into a, that kind of rapid bone loss. And you're going to lose 20% of your skeletal mass in two years. That is not going to happen in the postmenopausal years. You may lose 1% per year, 1.5% per year. So this is a problem. I, my answer to this question is no. Not postmenopausal bone loss. Well, if not, uh, is her bone density low because she failed to acquire peak bone mass? But, just family history, strong family history. And maybe part of this family history is a genetic disposition not to acquire peak bone mass. And so maybe her bone mass was low from the get-go. Uh, maybe her Z-score, we use a Z-score in, of course, premenopausal women, Maybe her Z-score was minus three at the age of 30, and she's still minus three. Well, that's good thinking, but then I got stuck. If that's the case, why is her distal radial bone density normal? This is kind of selective. The lumbar spine is low, and then the hip is kind of confusing because her femoral neck is lower than her total hip. We see this, it's a little, um, confusing there. So then I had to ask my question, the question, well, then what about her entire body skeletal mass? Is it low? We have lumbar spine minus three. Lumbar spine is basically trabecular bone. Uh, <clears throat> her distal radius is normal, predominantly cortical bone, and her hip is midway. So what percentage of, the, of our skeletons are made of that tough envelope of bone that we call cortical bone, and what percentage of our skeleton is that finely articulated trabecular network that I showed you in that earlier slide? Do you know the proportions? No. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so 80% of our skeletal mass is cortical bone. 20% of our skeletal mass is trabecular bone. So here's, so, so what we're dealing with is a woman in her early menopausal years whose total skeletal mass is really normal. 80% of it is normal. We have a selective issue with regard to her trabecular skeleton. Does she have osteoporosis? If you don't, you want to say yes? Why are you saying yes? Okay. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, her T-score is minus three. And we believe that that is a very important risk factor um, for fracture. And according to the rules, she has osteoporosis. <laughs>
if her z-score was minus 3 at the age of 30, would you say she had osteoporosis? No. And next week you're going to hear about this because Dr. Shane is going to talk to you about the definition of osteoporosis in premenopausal women. Uh, we cannot use the z-score and those rules in a premenopausal woman. Uh, if she had had a fracture, a fragility fracture, then, then we begin to talk about osteoporosis. Well, I'm a little confused here because I'm not sure she didn't have a low z-score for most of her premenopausal years and she's still low. So we wouldn't have called her osteoporotic when she was 35 and now she's 53. We're going to say we're now calling you osteoporosis. What is her risk of fracture? We'll talk about this. Think about what is her risk. Yeah, her risk is, um, well, with a z-score of minus three, it's, it's at least four, six times, uh, maybe six to eight times greater than someone whose t-score is normal. But if her risk of fracture over 10 years is uh, point, let's argue, 0.1%, multiply that by whatever the relative risk is, six-fold, eight-fold, her risk is very low still, 0.8%. So despite the fact that her relative risk is much greater, her absolute risk is very low. And uh, so uh, what, do you, what else would you like to know about her before you make your decision? She's come to you for advice. She saw some big bone expert at Hospital for Special Surgery. I won't tell you who the person was. Got some advice. She wasn't satisfied. She came up to see me. Well, I, I will just uh, give you some thoughts about that. At the uh, Hospital for Special Surgery, they did not measure her distal radius. We measured it here. And um, I, I sent her down and actually I repeated her bone density because there were some other issues. And uh, so they didn't know her distal radius was completely normal. Um, we have no information about her urinary calcium, so we need to get that. We do have bone marker data. Uh, what about, um, has she been treated with steroids? Maybe she had some, she had lupus when she was 30. No, she didn't. <laughs> no, no steroids. Uh, has she ever, is she on thyroid hormone? No, no thyroid hormone. Does she have a seizure disorder? No, no seizure disorder. Uh, has she been on uh, diuretics, like loop diuretics? No. So we don't have that. So she's kind of thin. She's five feet, four and a half. She weighs 124 pounds. Not really thin. Her BMI is about 20, 21. So I asked her about her weight. Okay, important question. Uh, uh, what has been your weight? And she said, well, my weight's ranged uh, between 110 and 120 for most of my adult life. And more recently, I've gained a little bit. Uh, okay, and then she said, doctor, I don't have an eating disorder. Never have had an eating disorder. Uh, and I, I believe her. Um, uh, what about your periods? Uh, she, well, she had been pregnant once, and besides that period of amenorrhea, she, her periods have been completely regular. Her menarche was at the usual age, and her period stopped at, whatever, two years ago. So uh, there's nothing there. Um, she wrote in her history that she drinks seven to ten drinks a week, and she drinks beer, wine, and spirits. Well, that was interesting. So I asked her about that. I said, um, where'd you go to college? I don't know. It could have been a Big Ten school or something, excuse me. <laughs> but uh, she went to a, a, a good school in the east, south, in the southeast, and I said, well, did you drink heavily in college? She said, not really. On the weekends, I yeah, would drink more than usual. Yeah. Uh, not, not much there. Doesn't smoke. So uh, we don't uh, have much more to go on. Is this somebody you'd get? Well, I don't, yeah, I mean, we should, I guess we should. Her CBC is completely normal. Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of being complete, um, it would be really shocking 
if she had myeloma. But you're, it's, a good, it's a good point because these people can show up with, actually early on they can show up with lumbar spine bone density reductions uh, uh, disproportionate. So it's a good thought. So we really haven't completely worked her up. Um, so we don't know about that. We don't know about her urinary calcium. Um, uh, with what you know, and what I know, what would you have told her yesterday? Ah. Okay, I didn't tell you that because um, I was, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but uh, her, frax, uh, her frax score is a hip 1.9% and her um, uh, total uh, major osteoporotic uh, risk is I think uh, 11%. You told me she had osteoporosis. Why would you do a FRAX? Do we do FRAX in people with osteoporosis? Aren't we supposed to treat and not? FRAX isn't supposed to give us any more information. We're only supposed to do FRAX in this country, by the way. In other countries, particularly in Europe, they would agree. They would do a FRAX because they don't adhere to the, they adhere to the definition, but they don't equate the definition with a treatment mandate. So they would have done a FRAX, and, we did, and their FRAX was done, and it did not meet the guidelines, okay? All right, how many of you uh, would say to her, beyond the things we're going to talk about, vitamin D, calcium, and exercise, of course, uh, uh, and really a good lifestyle, which she has, uh, how many of you would say, you know, you need, name it, Fosamax, Actinol, Boniva, Denosumab, you need a drug for this disease. How many of you would say, you know, you do have a problem and you are at risk, but your absolute risk is very low. Let's watch you for a little bit, you know. Let's give a little bit more time to see whether or not you're actively losing bone. We'll check your markers in six months and, uh, and not jump into the game of, not game, but a serious uh, issue of should you be treated with a pharmacological agent at the age of 53. How many of you would be thinking along those lines? Oh good, I'm so glad you did, because that's what I told her. <laughs> I, I, I thought the same thing. I, I, uh, uh, but she came to me expecting me to disagree with the doctor at HSS, who said the same thing, by the way, <laughs> with less information. So these are interesting, right? They're interesting problems. And I brought this case up because of this question of, you know, maybe she has been this way for a long time. And yeah, she is destined to have trouble, no doubt. But not right now, at least not, not as we can tell. If she no. didn't have a family history of breast cancer, would you put her on estrogen? Yeah, I would have thought that was a great idea. Yeah, but she, we, we didn't even discuss that, she said, because she told me, she said, no estrogens for me. I have a for primary, uh, she had a cousin of somebody very close to the family. First degree relative had had breast cancer, so it's out. You can't use it. But I agree with you. If she didn't, I think that would have been a very good, a very good approach. All right. So let's go back to uh, what we want to do in childhood. Uh, sufficient calcium and vitamin D is as important as in childhood as it is in adulthood. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, again, talked about these. I now want to focus on uh, exercise and talk about exercise. In adults, what do we talk about? We talk about walking, jogging, treadmill, weight training. Tai Chi, interestingly, has been clearly associated with a reduction in risk of hip fracture. It's very interesting. Um, uh, and obviously, Tai Chi doesn't improve skeletal mass. I can't believe Tai Chi improves skeletal mass. Why do you think Tai Chi, though, is so beneficial? Balance. Balance, that's right. Yeah, you, you be, you're balanced, and, and I may have, uh, this will be said a few times uh, again, but if you don't fall, you're not going to break your hip. I don't care how bad your osteoporosis is. And even swimming, because um, I swim, I, I think that swimming is a good exercise even though it's not classically an anti-gravity exercise. Now, what about childhood? Stay active. Stay active. 
that's the point. <laughs> our little children are become couch potatoes. They're at the computer all day. They're playing games. They're not out being active. And I think that's a, a, big, a big problem. All right, well, does exercise help? In adults, exercise has not been clearly shown to increase bone mass in the adult skeleton as a single variable. Although exercise we believe in, it's really helpful for muscle strength, for your balance, <clears throat> and for your overall fitness. So we believe in exercise, but we don't depend on exercise alone. Exercise alone will not increase your bone density. Uh, but it, it's <coughs> important. Now, what about children? Exercise has been clearly shown to increase bone mass in the growing skeleton. And this is a very interesting paper. <coughs> I don't think it's become a full um, published paper yet, but it, it supports a, 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 a feeling we've had for years and for which there are data. This is a very interesting study in Sweden, taking two schools, comparable schools, and see, lots and lots of children, and uh, in one of these schools, the children exercised 40 minutes per school day for eight years. So this went from years, uh, yeah, they started at six to eight years of age and they went to like 15 years of age. And then the control school um, had equal, uh, not quite, well, actually more, than, more children. And they, um, they exercised the regular school requirement which was 60 minutes per school week. So you had 40 minutes a day, every day, every school day for eight years versus 60 minutes a school week for eight years. And as you may know, there is a risk of fracture in childhood, particularly in some of the vulnerable early teen years when um, bone size is changing and sex steroids are changing. Um, bone turnover, becomes much greater in a shorter period of time, and that increased bone turnover may be the risk. In any event, the relative risk of fracture in the children who were exercising was reduced, and significantly so, to 0.48. Uh, bone density was higher in the children who exercised, and muscle strength was greater. Um, this actually supports a study by Tom Lloyd uh, many years ago in which he took identical twins in their teen years. He had a pair of identical twins. And he had one twin uh, exercising, like something like this, uh, for uh, I think it was a year. And then the other twin didn't. And by the end of that year, the exercising twin had markedly increased bone density, while the non-exercising twin uh, were, was showing the usual bone accrual, but not much. So I think it, it's pretty obvious that exercise in childhood is really important. Um, now, Rebecca, what do, what do we pediatricians say about that? Do you, is there is any progress in terms of the, the official recommendations in pediatrics or what we do with it? I mean, we say just exercise daily, ideally for at least 60 minutes a day, but in reality, people rarely do that. And yeah. Schools have less and less gym classes. The average is like twice a week, maybe, in gym classes. Yeah. But I think you should, um, I can barely hear you, and if I can barely hear you, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, Joe, are the, are the comments being picked up? Yeah, they are. Oh, they are? Even that comment? Um, a little bit. I can hear a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Spoke, so I think for the sake of uh, your, your fame on the <laughs> EFF website, maybe you don't want to be heard. <laughs> no, but, but the point was that it is advised. Um, uh, but often not followed through, and it, you know it's a challenge. Um, I would actually say the bigger issue is the people that you get referred that are the highest risk can't exercise. They're like non-ambulatory CP or other yeah. issues. Yeah. Those are the people that come yeah. with us with a DEXA or where we do one, and they can't do any of this. Good point. Yeah, within the the limitation of what they're. Uh, issue is, uh, of course. And that applies to adults too, by the way. Um, you know, we, we, pers we recommend exercise, but, but you have to see what the patient can do. You know, you're not going to ask the patient to start doing downhill skiing uh, 
if she's never skied. Even if she has skied, her bone density is really low, you may not recommend it. So yeah, it's within the reason of that patient's, uh, the, or the child, the pediatric patient's presentation, okay? So, but it's pretty clear that in contrast to adults, exercise leads to better skeletal health in children. And this is a study that kind of combined, I don't know if you can see it, oh, you can see it better than here. It combined a calcium uh, on one of those uh, axes um, with uh, physical exercise, and they measured calcaneal on the left by ultrasound, but they measured total hip by, B, by DEXA and femoral neck by DEXA. And you can see that uh, exercise was making a difference, uh, low exercise, high exercise. Uh, calcium intake seemed to make a difference, but together, high uh, exercise and high calcium intake together seem to be even more beneficial than either one alone, which is what you'd expect. So again, uh, sufficient calcium intake and uh, adequate physical exercise are both very um, positive features in terms of the accrual of um, bone mass. And conversely, we know that immobilization will lead to quite negative balance. Yeah? Um, so I don't know enough about PEDS, but is bone density in children directly associated with what the fracture risk is similar to adults or not necessarily? I don't, that's a very good question. I don't know how much, how well that's been looked at. Um, so I really can't answer that question. I don't know. I'm going to look to my pediatricians. Well, we define osteoporosis as having had a fracture. Yeah. So we don't rely exclusively on the bone density. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Even if your depth is powerful, if you haven't had a fracture, you do not have osteoporosis by definition. But we should do the same thing because they might have a tubal compression fracture, so we don't know actual known history of fracture. And that is so important if they have right, documented yeah, or tubal compression. Yeah. And you wouldn't pick that up unless you do. So if someone has, I think, terrible Z scores that I correct if they're short, and I know they're like minus five, minus six, we would definitely do plain films. Because if they have a tubal compression fracture, then I think the spot planes should be considered. Yeah, and that's fit. You can't do that with under the age of six. There's no norm. So even if someone comes to you with multiple fractures in their quarter, they have osteoporosis, and you don't do a DEXA. You don't do one after they're six if they're on the spot plane. So that And that, that's in keeping with how we view young adults, too. Uh, the the C-score alone doesn't define a disease. Okay, um, so uh, we have, a, this is really a summary of what we just uh, uh, covered. And uh, just the rhetorical question, children and adults are not getting enough exercise. Why? Well, we have an urban <coughs> environment, and most people live in an environment We've got TV and the like. We have computers. We have the automobile. We have fewer bicycles. Um, fewer bicycles. <laughs> I remember the first time I went to Beijing, uh, which was in 1996. And it was a very interesting um, experience for me. And what I saw looking out my hotel window was um, a wonderful tension between millions of bicycles and millions of automobiles. And it was just amazing to see how the bicycles and the cars were intertwined on the same road. Now, no tension whatsoever. There are no bicycles. The only bicycles you see are on the side roads. Um, there are still bicycles, but most people don't, even in China, are not using bicycles. And in children, we have the same thing. We've got the same issues and this other point of limited exercise programs in schools, um, which is uh, 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 another reason. Okay, so uh, a couple other th comments about achieving peak bone mass. Uh, this is the phenomenon of stunting. Uh, do you all learn about stunting? Stunting is a very interesting uh, issue, um, and wh what, it, it, what it is, it's best defined in this way. A child in the fourth grade, let's say, looks like he or she should be in the first grade. Uh, and in uh, my trips to Armenia, which I do a lot, we have a bunch of, well, a group of children that we meet with um, yearly because we uh, help to sponsor them. And they all come from all over, all parts of the country. And I see this so often. Uh, a youngster, 
who looks like he or she's in the first grade, and they're 10 years old. And we don't really know the etiology of stunting. Um, nutrition, obviously, but is there other, other things like parasitic and chronic uh, uh, intestinal infections? So um, I was with my friend Don Guang, who was from in the Psychiatric Institute uh, last May in Hangzhou. Uh, Hangzhou is a city uh, near Shanghai. Uh, it's a small city of about 10 million people. And I thought this was kind of interesting. You can see they were welcoming me. <laughs> On the, the hospital billboard, said, welcome Professor John Goes. I thought it was amazing. Uh, they were very, very nice. Uh, stunt, stunting in China has actually fallen. Um, in 2002, 22% of the population under five were stunted. And now that figure, well, more, more recently, that figure has been cut in half. Um, in Armenia, as I mentioned, even recent figures show that about 15 to 20 percent of Armenian children have evidence for stunting. So everything is compromised in this phenomenon. Uh, these children are born normally. They're maternally. We don't know that there's a maternal issue, but their birth weights are normal. Their APGAR scores are okay. And they're fine, fine, fine. And then they drop off the growth curve. And why they stop growing don't know, unless you know. No, no. I, anyway, it is something to bear in mind. All right, so let's move on. Did you see it much in the United States? Sorry? Any stunting in other places in the United States? Yeah, there is stunting in the U.S. Um, you have to go to the very poor parts of the U.S., like the Appalachian region. Uh, but there is stunting in the United States. I don't know about inner city uh, data. Are there any data on inner city nutrition? Because there may be some issues there, but I know in Appalachia there is um, there is stunting in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on and talk about the adults, the age-related and this uh, accelerated uh, bone loss. Uh, so. Uh, we're talking about loss of bone quality as loss of bone mass. We're, we're talking about two elements here. Um, our parameter is bone density, because that's the easiest to measure. But the pathophysiology is tied up with a microstructure as well. So here's this cartoon again. And now we're going to talk about the downslope of this curve. This is the age-related uh, bone loss that uh, we are all experiencing. Uh, as we get older. And this is related to bone turnover. Um, the bone turnover is related in part to the reduction in sex steroids, but the increase in bone turnover, both resorption and formation, uh, the higher the bone turnover in adults, the greater the bone loss. And actually, the greater the risk of fracture. Uh, the uh, bone turnover is an independent risk factor for fracture. Uh, it is also a marker of, a predictor of bone loss, but it has an, another feature that is active bone resorption or bone turnover creates a lot of um, vulnerable uh, 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 sites in bone. Those bone remodeling units, when they're, re, uh, when they're remodeling, they're points of vulnerability. So the more you have bone remodeling units, actually, during that time, you are more vulnerable uh, uh, at those uh, sites. There is also uh, an issue of bone uh, osteoblast function that's compromised. So for each remodeling unit, if you're not going to um, replace the, the amount of bone that's been resorbed because of some defect in osteoblast function, uh, you can have uh, bone loss. So it's bone turnover, it's, it's a uh, dichotomous uh, imbalance between uh, excessive osteoclast activity and uh, impaired osteoblast activity that um, is uh, in part responsible for age-related bone loss. Uh, and other aspects are um, sex steroid deficiency that we'll talk about and then uh, calcium absorption. Um, people who aren't absorbing enough calcium are, again, not going to have enough substrate to replace the bone that's lost. 
and that relates to D deficiency and age-related um, impairment in the ability to activate vitamin D. There's also an end organ resistance uh, to vitamin D as we get older, and that may lead, in some people's mind, to a secondary hyperparathyroidism. There is an age-related increase in parathyroid hormone, um, independent of the serum calcium. And uh, there are some thoughts about this being um, not good uh, uh, for bone. Uh, I'm not totally sure about that, uh, but that is um, a common hypothesis. And all of this leads to um, accelerated bone loss. So sex steroid deficiency um, is part of this imbalance because we know, particularly with estrogen deficiency, that there is a marked increase in osteoclast activity. Um, there is a reduction in osteoblast and in the lifespan of the osteocyte. And again, as I said before, this, um, be, this imbalance um, is accelerated <coughs> by um, sex steroid deficiency, particularly in the early menopausal years. So uh, this is the, one of the famous uh, cartoons about estrogen-related bone loss at the menopause. You see in the orange um, curve, there is that accelerated period between the ages of 50 and 60 when women are losing bone more rapidly than men who are in the yellow. They, of course, have more peak bone mass and maintain it, and then they lose bone mass uh, at a more linear rate over life unless, of course, men become hypogonadal and men do become hypogonadal. There are diseases that are associated with hypogonadism, as you know, and uh, men who are on androgen uh, depletion therapy for prostate cancer will, again, they'll reproduce the menopause, only it's an andropause, and they'll go through a period of accelerated bone loss. But classically, that doesn't happen in men. Um, men don't have an abrupt loss of their androgens unless there is a disease or a therapy that will lead to that, while women uh, typically, during the menopause, who are not estrogen replaced, will have this period that lasts for about 10 years, and the acceleration is about twice the normal rate of bone loss, maybe 1% per year. So we've got that superimposed on age-related bone loss, and that's why that's one reason why women um, seem to be at greater risk for osteoporosis, and why the osteoporosis seems to surface earlier than it does in men. Okay, so we have um, the, now the C example <coughs> is a menopause related um, bone loss and obviously if you're losing bone more rapidly, um, you're gonna reach that magic T-score uh, faster than you would if you aren't experiencing accelerated bone loss. So the estrogen deficiency, the, the mechanism is, is obviously related to cytokines and which ones we really don't know, but interleukin-1, interleukin-6 have been implicated as uh, secondary effects of estrogen deficiency. Um, and that then leads to an increase in rank ligand and a reduction in OPG. So that imbalance I talked to you about on Tuesday, may, uh, when it's in, in the context of estrogen deficiency, may be mediated by these cytokines. And this imbalance in rank ligand and OPG leads to increased bone resorption and then bone loss. Next week we'll talk about androgen deficiency. If you're androgen deficient, you're estrogen deficient. It's a very interesting thought. You cannot, um, you cannot have estrogen sufficiency if you're androgen deficient because there's only one way to make estrogens and that is starting with androgens, both in women and in men. Okay, so the accelerated bone loss is shown very nicely here. This is from the Rotterdam study. Uh, and looking at yearly uh, rates of change by BMD, the women are the orange, the men are the blue. And you can see in this early period, 55 to 64, the rate of bone loss in the orange is much greater, the women, than in the blue, the men. And then, but later, the, 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 the rates kind of even out. Um, in this particular example, they seem to be even greater with aging. 
but the men and the women don't, are not distinguished anymore. It's just that early uh, 55 to 65 period when women are at greater risk and uh, by virtue of their, uh, the, the estrogen deficiency. And then there are situations where superimposed on the menopause and age, there are other factors that make the situation even worse. And these are the secondary um, uh, issues uh, that we have to deal with. We've talked about immobilization, uh, drugs, glucocorticoids, the most important secondary cause of osteoporosis, anticonvulsants, GnRH analogs, aromatase inhibitors, excess use of thyroid hormone, uh, PPIs, I put a question mark there, how many of you uh, subscribe to the thought that PPIs are bad for your bones? PPIs reduce your gastric acid. And the thinking is that by reducing gastric acid, you're reducing calcium absorption. And by reducing <laughs> calcium absorption, of course, that's not good. Um, so that's the thinking. And there is epidemiology to argue that PPIs are associated with bone loss. Uh, you, uh, you probably know that someone who's achlorhydric, so you're on a PPI, so you're achlorhydric, um, they absorb calcium, right? If you have somebody who's achlorhydric and you give them calcium citrate, will they absorb the calcium? They will because calcium citrate does not require gastric acid. Calcium carbonate does require gastric acid. So if somebody's on a PPI, they won't absorb calcium carbonate. Yeah, well, in the fasting state. But they will absorb calcium if they have a protein-based meal because that provides the acidic milieu by, that the calcium carbonate needs, or the calcium needs in calcium carbonate to absorb it. So this whole thing about PPI never made a lot of sense to me. And we'll pick this up in a moment. So then there are diseases, malabsorption. Um, celiac disease is the, the big disease we always think about. We have a huge celiac program here. Um, uh, Dr. Peter Green is one of the world's experts in celiac disease. And it's pretty clear that you can have celiac disease and not know it. Um, uh, and uh, the serologies are positive, And even if the serologies are negative, you do a small bowel biopsy and you find evidence for celiac disease. Um, so it is a very important part of a differential diagnosis of unexplained. And that woman I mentioned before, this 53-year-old, somebody was thinking about it right from the get-go. Could she have celiac disease? She doesn't appear to have celiac disease by her no, la no GI symptomatology that would suggest that. And, a, and the serologies are negative. But it is something to consider. A hyperpara has a very selective uh, kind of bone loss syndrome that we'll talk about next week. Hypogonadism, of course hyperthyroidism, Cushing's disease, myeloma, a whole bunch of diseases uh, that can be associated. So let's go back to this protein pump inhibitor story. So Bill Leslie in Canada, in Manitoba, uh, is one of the great uh, uh, epidemiologists of our time as it relates to uh, uh, osteoporosis. So his group uh, presented a very interesting abstract a year and a half ago, um, and it was the question of association versus causality. And epidemiology, as you all know, will <coughs> take A and take B and say A and B are related, okay? And that's fine, but the thing you have to be careful about is the causality between A and B. A and B may be related, but there may be a million steps between A and B. It may be A and Z and so to infer that A and B are causally related, A causes B, PPIs cause osteoporosis, is a real leap of faith. Uh, so what they asked the, is, was this, what is, one of, what are, is, there, is there a variable here that leads people who are at risk for osteoporosis to be treated with a PPI? Is, it, is either greater morbidity and or pre-existing fractures more likely to be associated with the prescription of PPIs? So what they did 
was they mined this huge database from Manitoba, 27,000 subjects, and 11%, that's a huge number, 11% were prescribed uh, PPIs. And they found that the high uh, medical comorbidity, <coughs> those people who had medical comorbidities, not necessarily bone density, anything, cardiovascular, you name it, were more likely to lead to a PPI prescription, 18, 19% to say, and the DEXA-based diagnosis of osteoporosis was more likely to be, prescri to be prescribed PPIs. So there is a variable here that probably had nothing to do with PPIs. It's an association. And getting back to the pathogenesis of PPI-associated bone loss, the GI tract can't be the cause because if people are taking calcium properly, they'll be absorbing it. And moreover, if you uh, inhibit the proton pump in the osteoclast, presumably the PPIs are doing that, you should have the opposite effect. You should impair osteoclast function. So the whole thing doesn't make any sense to me. And I think this is an interesting epidemiological association, but not to mis don't, don't misunderstand, at least my view, is that I would be very careful to say that uh, PPIs cause. Now, the gastroenterologists have picked this up. Ah, you know, you're, you're, you have osteoporosis, you shouldn't take a PPI. Or if you are taking a PPI, you need to have your bone density checked, so we have to see what, they, they, they're a little nuts about this. So your friends around the, uh, around the corner need a little bit more insight. So PPIs may be associated with fracture because they are more likely to be prescribed among those who are increased risk for osteoporosis. All right. Uh, we, we've gone a little bit. Do you want to take a break? I hate to think this is a marathon. We, we, you know, we're not in any huge rush. Maybe we take a little break? Let's take a little break. Um, five minutes? Okay. A listing of, you know, alleged conditions, uh, not alleged conditions, conditions alleged to be associated with bone loss. And um, many, in many situations, um, that is the case, some more and some less. We obviously are not going to go over all of these, but you, we're, we're touching on a lot of them as we go through. Um, the big ones, um, the diseases, uh, we've talked about malabsorption, particularly celiac, hypogonadism. Um, COPD has its own skeletal disease, independent of the steroids that are used for COPD. Rheumatoid arthritis is even in the FRAX tool. It's such an important, independent uh, condition uh, uh, again, apart from the treatments that are used for uh, RA, myeloma, and then D deficiency, hypercalcuria sometimes as a primary abnormality, and then the drugs we've talked about, um, some of them are here. So, uh, so this is the kind of scheme that you look at, aging, menopause, other risk factors all conspire to increase bone loss. We have the pediatric question of failure to achieve optimal peak bone mass. That feeds into low bone density. And then uh, we have this other entity, which we're going to talk about uh, particularly next week, of bone, whatever poor bone quality means as a separate entity from low bone density. Uh, and together, you have a disposition to uh, fractures. The propensity to fall, we have. Uh, we do, not, um, we do not emphasize enough, but I, I think this needs some more attention than we've had in the past. Um, well, you can have the world's worst bone density, the world's worst bone quality, but you have to fall to break your hip. Okay, so going back to pictures, on the left is a wonderful piece of bone, and on the right is the same wonderful piece of bone. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that kind of bone for our whole lives? Unfortunately, uh, bone deteriorates. And you go from good bone to not so good bone to terrible bone. And obviously, the goal of our field is to prevent this inevitable loss of bone microstructure. Can we reverse it if it's gone this far? Can we take a broken down piece of bone and make it less broken down? Or, for some of you who still dream, 
can we cure this disease? Obviously not yet, but we're getting there. And next week we'll talk about that. We want to improve other aspects. Bone size is related to bone strength and a two-dimensional plane. And material properties. I think Michelle had talked to you yesterday, I think, on reference point indentation and diabetes. That's a material property of bone. If we had access to it as we are now with RPI, maybe there are ways we can improve. So it's a lot of things that we want to do. Okay? So here again, another famous picture of David Dempster. On the left, normal. On the right, abnormal. When we talk about microstructure of bone, we're talking about a, an element that is not easily accessed in a given patient. You can't see microstructure of bone unless you have HRPQCT the way we do, but the typical doctor, the typical medical center, cannot see microstructure. They don't have HRPQCT, and they don't do bone biopsies. So where, what do we what do we use to operationally diagnose this disease? Now, it's DEXA. Uh, and you know, you, you, were gro you grew up with DEXA. You said, oh, big deal, DEXA. We know about DEXA. From the first day of our fellowships, we learned about DEXA. DEXA is only 30 years old, 1986 was when DEXA became routinely available in the United States. Before 1986, there was no DEXA. There was no way of quantitating bone mass. We depended on the x-ray. And by the time you saw washed out bones by x-ray, uh, that patient had severe osteoporosis. So DEXA revolutionized our field. DEXA gave us a surrogate marker that was powerfully predictive of fracture. Bone qualities we're getting to, but bone density is what we're uh, depending on. And bone density, for those of you who are interested in uh, precision of measurement, I just thought this would be interesting, um, that the coefficient of variation of a DEXA measurement of the hip, lumbar spine and forearm is really remarkable compared to the coefficient of variation of routine tests that we uh, use. I mean, the calcium has a 3 or 4 percent coefficient of variation. The glucose, 2, 2 and a half percent. So for people who fret about the accuracy, uh, I shouldn't say accuracy, the precision of DEXA, it's really good. It's a very precise tool. The hip is the least precise of the three sites we measure. Um, it is more difficult to position uh, uh, the hip because you have to internally rotate. We'll talk about this tomorrow. You have to internally rotate the hips to straighten out the femoral shaft, and you have to keep that patient internally rotated. Some sites don't do that well. We use a Velcro uh, strap to keep the ankle inverted. Um, there are some patients who can't internally rotate. They have osteoarthritis and that, that joint doesn't move. So there are um, issues with regard to the hip measurement that makes it the least accurate, I'm sorry, not accurate, that's not the word I want to use, the least precise. At when I'm, accuracy is not precision. Accuracy is, is this truly measuring bone mineral? And accuracy, it's about 5%, which is very good. So if you do a bone mass measurement of an animal and then you ash the specimen, you'll find that that estimate of grams per centimeter squared will be within 5% of the actual amount of calcium in that ash specimen. So accuracy is about 5%. Precision, that is the reproducibility, you put me on the table 10 times and you do a standard deviation, will be around 1% to 2%. Now, it is variable by sight. I don't mean anatomical site, I mean facility. Uh, this is not like doing a chest x-ray, where I believe you just push a button and you get a chest x-ray. <laughs> nobody, you know, nobody cares about how accurate or precise a chest x-ray is. Um, but um, 
to really do this properly, the technologist has to be certified by the International Society of Clinical Densitometry, the ISCD, uh, and since I'm a past president of the ISCD, I believe strongly that that's important. Uh, those who interpret the bone density test, uh, we have five interpreters in our group, and they are all certified by the ISCD. And it's a training course to make sure you understand the instrument and know how to position the patient, know how to read this, the scans. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I have an attending at my institution who believes that the DEXs are very inaccurate, and mm -hmm. he cites studies by this uh, person, Bolotin, Professor Bolotin, B O L O T I N. And so I was wondering um, if you were. No, aware I don't know Bolotin. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, that person, Bolotin. Um, uh, I, I don't think that's right. Um, it is true that in centers that aren't uh, expert, there can be much worse precision. I agree with that point. But if you have a center like ours, um, I would argue that um, that's not, not true. Not precise, but accurate. Oh, oh actually. Has trouble no. with, he says that they're very inaccurate. No. You mean what, in terms of how much, what is it really telling you? Right. No. It's, not, okay. it's not true. Okay. Can't be true. Okay. First of all, the animal data are pretty convincing. And secondly, and we're going to talk about that, what is the outcome of the predictive value of a DEXA test? And we'll, we'll pick okay. that up. But you, I think you might be able to go back to him and okay. argue otherwise, hopefully. Okay, so this is Lori Olson. Um, Lori is our chief uh, x-ray tech. She has been doing bone density for 21 years. Uh, you'll meet Lori tomorrow. Um, uh, Kevin uh, Morgan, who also is a senior, has been with us for 20 years. So two of our four radiation technologists have had 20 years of experience doing only DEXA. They do only DEXA. That's another point. If the DEXA is in a radiology suite where the techs rotate every other day, yeah, it can be a mess. I agree with you. But that we're not teaching that. We want the techs to be certified, to be trained, and to stick with the technology. And if you have that, then I think that argument is not, um, not uh, uh, generalizable. Um, doctor, I don't want to have a DEXA. I'm going to get radiation exposure. I've had too much x-rays in my life. You've heard that how many times? How many times? So please tell your patient it is not a dangerous test. The radiation exposure is about one-fifth of a chest x-ray. Uh, the radiation exposure next time your patient or you take a trip to Denver, not even to the west coast, you'll get much more cosmic radiation up at 35,000 feet than you will with this DEXA test. That's why um, uh, we do it whenever we want. We do it yearly. Some of our research studies, we do DEXA every six months. In terms of scatter of the instrument, um, there is essentially no scatter of this instrument, so you don't need to shield the room, and the tech uh, doesn't even have to be behind a plexiglass, uh, although uh, we do have plexiglass, but it's, it's because of a sense that you, there might be, but there isn't any. There really isn't any scatter for this machine, so it really is safe. I mentioned the accuracy. It's about 5%. I mentioned, mentioned precision. We have normative uh, population bases now um, uh, for all ages. I, I think, Rebecca, we go down to four, don't we, with the database? Yeah. I, six? I thought it was four. All right. Well, I, there are some databases that go down to four. And then in terms of the older um, uh, individuals, the databases uh, go up to 80 or so. But she's talking about You have to have the software. The software only goes to six. Really? Okay. I thought. Okay. Well, your our software goes the to logistics. six. The logistics. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm okay. But I do think there are software uh, packages that go down to four, but but not to one. You know, it's okay. But anyway, the large databases, uh, and now we're getting to another point, uh, correlating with fracture and the diagnostic standard. Okay. So. Does it reflect bone strains? Okay. Well, here's a, a cadaver study, uh, you know, human cadaver study, 
correlating the trochanteric bone density um, with femoral failure load. And you can see there's a straight line relationship. Um, the uh, lower the bone density, the lower the bone strength. The higher the bone density, the higher the bone strength. And here's the really important point. For every standard deviation reduction in bone density, there's a doubling of fracture risk. Now, do you know of any other surrogate marker that is as powerfully predictive of an end clinical event as is this marker, the bone density test, a predictor of fracture? L let me uh, ask you, uh, what about the cholesterol? The, everybody, you know, everybody goes around knowing what their cholesterol number is, as if that is the be-all and end-all. That is predictive of cardiovascular risk. Yeah, it is, but it isn't close to this kind of relation. It's not close. Blood pressure as a predictor of stroke, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Not better than this, though. So this is remarkable that you can take a test and say how it is related to your risk of fracture. And it is uh, not, but there are several others we're going to talk about, but it's definitely a key risk factor for the fragility fracture. And as I indicated before, it is reflecting in some way bone strength. Uh, people say, you know, DEX is such a, um, uh, they've used the word dirty test or crude test. You know, it, it's calcium per square centimeter of space. It's a two-dimensional depiction. It's not even a true bone density. A true bone density is volumetric per cubic centimeter of space. DEX is not three, it's not volumetric, not QCT. <coughs> uh, and it's, it, it's influenced by size. We don't always correct for size. That can be influenced a, a great deal. It's influenced by osteoarthritis in the back or the hip. And there are all kinds of imponderables and conundrums that can confound the bone density test. Nevertheless, <laughs> despite all that, it is really good. It's really good. And it's so good that the World Health Organization in 1994 looked at this DEXA test in the context of lifetime risk of fracture. <clears throat> and the lifetime risk of fracture of a 50-year-old woman living to her expected lifespan whose bone density was less than minus 2.5 was 50 percent or greater. And that was considered to be such a high risk that the disease became defined by the risk. And at that point, if you have a risk of by T-score of minus 2.5, and that of course is related to the young peak bone mass standards, um, you have a sufficient risk to have a fracture that you have a disease, and it's called osteoporosis. It really did revolutionize our field because we could talk about somebody having a disease before that person had a fracture and we could begin to do something about it. And in 1995, one year later, the first FDA approved drug that was really efficacious, short of estrogen, um, uh, was approved, uh, alendronate. So on the heels of a definition of a disease, we then began to have FDA approved drugs to treat that disease. So it was a very interesting historical point. Now the World Health Organization also um, uh, suggested that there was another category of individuals in the yellow, uh, those with T-scores between minus 1 and minus 2.5, who didn't have osteoporosis but had low bone density. Um, it was not otherwise defined. Unfortunately, they used the term osteopenia. And uh, it sounds like a disease. And I don't know if you've had patients come to you, but I've had patients come to me and say, doctor, I don't have osteoporosis, but I have osteopenia. Uh, 
and what are you going to do about my osteopenia? It's like, that's a disease, you know? It's not. We don't know enough about this, although we're learning. But certainly not everybody with osteopenia is going to have osteoporosis or is necessarily at risk for a fracture. We have to work this out, and we're going to. And then those who are lucky enough to be within one standard deviation of peak bone mass are considered to be normal. Okay? So that's the operational definition of osteoporosis. And it has become ingrained in the system by which we uh, pay for tests. If you don't have a T-score definition of osteoporosis, CMS, which is the Medicare payer, says you don't have osteoporosis. Isn't that amazing? You have to have a T-score less than minus 2.5 in order for you to be defined as osteoporosis. We've come full circle here, which is to say if you have a fracture, an osteoporotic fracture, and you don't have a T-score less than minus 2.5, according to the CMS, you don't have osteoporosis. So all these points we're going to touch on. So high risk, minus 2.5, there is a therapeutic mandate um, generally, but not always. We tend to treat these individuals. But what about this never, never land of osteopenia? What do we do? First of all, are they at risk? What do we know about osteopenia and risk? Uh, I, I've just told you that the operational de definition is minus 2.5. Uh, and, and then again, the next step is, well, if we rely exclusively on the T-score, uh, will we diagnose most of the osteoporotic fractures that occur in postmenopausal women and men? That's a rhetorical question. First, is, are these people without osteoporosis by DEXA at risk? This is work by Ethel Cyrus. Uh, the famous NORA study that tracked bone density in these three categories. Initially, these were peripheral um, uh, bone density measurements, but they were, the data were um, confirmed by central DEXA. Uh, in, in this intermediate group, minus 1 to minus 2.5, uh, both in terms of any osteoporotic fracture or specifically with regard to the hip fracture, there was an intermediate risk between those who had normal bone densities on the left and those who had osteoporotic bone densities on the right. So uh, clearly, um, the people who are in this um, category of low bone density osteopenia do have a higher risk of fracture than those who are normal, but not as high as those who have densitometric diagnosis of osteoporosis. Okay, so then uh, Dr. Cyrus went further and she looked at the bone mineral density distribution of this large cohort of over 200,000 people. And this was the average bone density uh, uh, that this cohort had. And then she looked at the um, risk of fracture, the fracture rate in the yellow. And you can see, as we know, the lower the bone density, going this way, the yellow bars go up. So this is reinventing the world, the, the wheel. The, the lower the bone density, the higher the fracture risk. Okay, so that's good. But what she then showed in the blue was that the number, not the rate, the number of fractures, the number of women with fractures in blue, peaked at a level of bone density that was not osteoporotic. And here is the magic number, minus 2.5. And in this group are the greatest number of subjects with fractures. And they're falling into the osteopenic category. And there are even people who have normal bone density who are having fragility fractures. Now, this has also been uh, looked at from the study of osteoporotic fractures with regard to hip uh, fractures and hip T-scores. And again, you can see that the distribution curve is in the osteopenic range. 
and the blue bars are those who have hip fractures. So again, for hip fractures, as well as for all fractures, um, risk is greater in the ones who have osteoporosis, but the numbers of subjects, because there are so many greater people with osteopenia, the numbers are greater in the osteopenic grade. So, the statement that more osteoporotic fractures occur in subjects without osteoporosis by the T-score than in those with osteoporosis by the T-score. And it therefore follows that DEXA has not captured the totality of risk. There must be other risk factors that are complementary, uh, perhaps even equally important to DEXA to give us a better sense of the risk of a fracture. And uh, the challenge was to identify those risk factors in a way that would be not just verifiably predictable, but also easily obtainable. Not extreme CT, please. Not bone markers, because these are not available. Easy things that are independently predictive of a fracture. And then, to apply this to the entire world, it doesn't matter where you are, you should be able to use this tool to establish fracture risk. And even at its extreme, you should be able to do this without even a DEXA test. You should be able to identify risk without even having a DEXA. Why is that important? Because most places in the world don't have DEXA. Uh, I'll give you some examples. When I started my work in Armenia 10 years ago, there was one DEXA unit for 3 million people. That was about the same as the ratio of DEXAs to people in China. There were only about 200 DEXA machines in China. Okay? So you're not going to do DEXA in China and you're not going to do DEXA in Armenia. On the other hand, in New York City, the joke I make, is that there are more DEXA units on Park Avenue than there are psychiatrists. <laughs> it depends on where you are. But this, this idea was to be able to use a fracture risk assessment tool as easy as you could. Okay, so here are the key points that you would want to know about a patient. Uh, and each of these has been shown uh, to be independently, but di with different value, uh, independently predictive of fracture risk. And you can, you can look at this and you can say, gee, this is easy. I can get this uh, information in the boondocks. Doesn't matter, yeah. Um, do you know if it's ever been looked at to see if there's any direct association between bone density and dentition? I, no, I, I, I don't think, well, I'll make two comments about that. I think the answer is no. Is there, has anyone looked at DEXA in relation to, to dentition? Two things to say. One, the teeth are completely separate from the skeletal system as we know it. The teeth are not, they're just divorced from the skeleton. They, they, there's no metabolism. The teeth don't metabolize. Teeth are not dead but they're not active, they don't, but there's no remodeling. That's why when you have a cavity, it has to be filled. <laughs> you can't fill a cavity by yourself. Uh, but there may be a relationship because dentition has been related to overall health. And people who have very poor oral hygiene tend to have very poor other things. And, and that may also relate to skeletal health, but I'm not totally sure about that. So the answer is yes and no. Okay. Okay, what about age? How do, what do we think about age? So this is a very interesting, uh, nice example of how important age is. Um, the, the graph is showing bone density falling uh, cross-sectionally and fracture risk going up. We know that. The lower the bone density, the higher the risk. But this is showing something else. These isobars are now related to age. Younger age, older age. For any given bone density, here's that green line, the risk of fracture goes up as a function of age. So 
that woman I told you about, her T-score is minus three. She's 53 years of age. Um, her risk of fracture is she's protected by her age. If she doesn't change her bone density at all, by the time she's 73, she's going to be way up there. So age by itself is an independent risk factor for fracture and cannot, is not captured by the bone density test. Now, example. Here is someone age 50, T-score minus 2.5, and it doesn't matter what her fracture is. She might have had other issues to make her at 12% fracture risk. Seems high to me, but whatever. Uh, she has the same T-score. Now she's 20 years older, and her risk is 24%. Are you, are you able to see through me? <laughs> I'm transparent. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll no, try no, to stay great. back. Um, so the age alone, independent of the T-score, is giving her um, a risk. Well, what about fractures? What about fractures? So here's another example, a 60-year-old woman. Uh, her T-score is minus 1.8. She's never had a fracture. And I don't know why these numbers, 12%, it doesn't matter what the number is. The point is that without a fracture at age 60, she's at 12%. She has a fragility fracture at that same age, same T-score, and now her risk is almost double. Okay? So we have bone density as an independent risk factor. We have age as an independent risk factor. And now we have the previous fracture as a very important uh, separate risk factor. And of course, the model is a few other independent risk factors, current glucocorticoid use, family history of hip fractures, very, very important. Uh, current smoking is a very important risk factor. Alcohol, now the three units of alcohol per day, it's because this is a British conception. And the Brits talk about units of alcohol, not drinks, you know, we say, you know, or glasses of wine. They call them units. So a unit is a glass of beer, a unit is um, a four ounces of wine, uh, one or two ounces of, of spirits. Th th three or more is considered to be uh, an independent risk factor. Um, the matter of drinking alcohol, just for your information, epidemiologically, um, it, alcohol in moderation, that is to say less than three, <laughs> Um, is not a risk factor, and in fact, there have been some studies to show that modest alcohol intake is actually protective. I don't know why, but it helps justify my glass of wine. Um, I'm not saying people should drink, I mean, don't get me wrong, but people who drink, nothing wrong with it. It's not a sin, for sure, and uh, it's not bad for your bones. Um, in fact, it's good for a lot of things, I think. Um, so, uh, but, but obviously, when it's abused, um, uh, or excessively used, then it's a real issue. And then secondary causes, uh, particularly rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, now each of these risk factors is weighted differently, and this is a scale of um, probabilities of risk factor uh, with each of these weighted. And you can see that the prior fracture is the really important. Uh, family history is really important. Steroid use is important, and then you go down the line. So depending on what threshold you want to use, if you use a very stringent threshold, you'll only take into account the prior fracture. But FRAX wants to include as much as it can. Uh, if you did B threshold, you'd include family history and steroids, but you want to include everything. So you lower your threshold, and you include all these, but you have to weight them because they're differentially important. And that's the FRAX. The FRAX tool has a big black box. We have no idea how, these, how it's done, but the idea. I apologize. I just made to say that I don't use FRAX usually, but is it any prior fracture, or is it just fragility fracture? Any fr uh, prior fracture over the age of 50. Well, over the age of 50. Fracture at 10 no, we're not. We're not no, 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 no. So we're, first of all, we're within a range of 50 or older, okay? And secondly, it's a, a non, 
we say it's a non-traumatic fracture. Automobile accident, uh, skiing accident, um, someone, uh, you know, very violent trauma is not included. Now, having said that, and, and it really, we don't include it, having said that, uh, there's an interesting point. Even traumatic fractures are a risk for a further fracture. So we're blurring the distinction these days between the obvious fracture. Of course, I'd, of, of course the, violent, the trauma was so violent, anybody would have had a fracture, that kind of statement, to nevertheless, there are some people who subjected to the same trauma would not have fractured. So what is different about that person? And uh, by the way, um, the discovery of high bone mass genes, the LRP5 story, was discovered by the following example. There was a car with lots of people in it um, that was in a <coughs> horrendous automobile accident. It was in the Midwest. And everybody in the car, there were a bunch of people, nine people were in this car. They all broke all their bones, except for one person. She didn't break any bone. And Bob Recker, who's from the University of Nebraska in Omaha, dis found that person. <laughs> and, and she had a high bone mass gene. And that broke, up the whole, that broke the whole field open in terms of identifying the genetic high bone mass the genes. In fact, Doug Keel might talk about that. And that was the example. This woman should have broken every bone in her body and didn't. So she was special. All right, so um, we have fracs ever since 2008. And in the United States, and it varies from country to country, because this is an economic threshold. Is it, when is it cost effective to treat? That is the discussion. If you have a 10-year fracture risk of greater than 20%, uh, percent, of a major fracture risk, or, or specifically a hip fracture risk of greater than 3%, uh, you, it is said that it is cost effective to treat. Now, the basis of the cost effective is the price of alendronate when this tool was developed. And in those days, um, alendronate was costing about, I believe, $600 a year. <coughs> it's cheaper now, so, uh, but the threshold hasn't changed. But it was based on an average pr price for the drug of $600 per year. So these are two very important numbers uh, for in this country. Greater than 20% major fracture risk or greater than 3% hip fracture risk. So this is the FRAX tool, I'm sure. All of you have used FRAX? Yeah, yeah, you've used it? Okay. So this is the um, handsome man in the lower left-hand corner. This is John Canis. Uh, and he is the brains behind the whole concept of FRAX. And you can see on the left, um, it's country specific. So you have to identify where you are because these risk factors are different from country to country. And so you have to know where you are in the world. Are you in Japan? Are you in the US? Are you in China? If you, then you populate the questions and these are all the things we've talked about and you put in the absolute bone density these days and then it, it, you, you indicate what instrument you're using and it turns that into a T-score. And then you get a number. And in the US, for whatever we put in this uh, questionnaire, you get the number of 10% for any fracture, 2.5% over 10 years for the hip. So we would not treat, typically, using just fracs, we would not treat. Now, if you use the same information and make that person Japanese, you change fracture risk. If you use the same information and make that person Chinese, I, don't, I shouldn't say Chinese, <laughs> not Chinese, from China. Um, if the person is Chinese, you would use an American. If the person's in this country, you'd use this space. Although that's not clear, by the way but you would. And then if you, um, I just did this a couple of weeks ago because when I was in Korea, I took the information off the current fracs. So what I told you, just showed you is a little out of date. 
but you put in all the information uh, based on what I, I, so I had a 75 year old woman. She had no other risk factors. Her bone density was 0.6 milligrams per centimeter squared at the femoral neck with a whole logic machine. And then I put in China, Korea, US, and Japan. For any major osteoporotic fracture, it's really interesting. In China and Korea, the risks are much lower than now Japan has changed. Japan and US are pretty much the same. And uh, similarly, a uh, risk of hip fracture for the same person, the risks are lower in China and to Korea versus USA and Japan. So uh, risk, the FRAX tool ideally is based on data, epidemiological data from the country. Now, are there epidemiological data from all countries? And the answer is no. And if you don't have epidemiological data from a given country, what do you do? Well, you, then you try to find a surrogate country. So I had cause for being interested in this because uh, I was wanting to have a frac tool for Armenia. And we had no data for Armenia. Uh, so we actually did a kind of an interesting survey and we considered several uh, countries that might work. We considered Lebanon, we considered Israel, we considered Germany, the United States, and Romania. And uh, we came up with a country that seemed to be closest to Armenia. Uh, what do you think we picked? Not that you really should know this. <laughs> This is like not important. <laughs> it's just a way of doing it. You have to, you know, you figure, well, what country is like Armenia? Well, we came up with Romania. And we had some strange reasons for thinking about Romania. Um, one interesting point about Romania is that the Roma, the gypsies, uh, lived for many, many years with the Armenians in the diasporas that went back and forth. And there are, there are a number of words in uh, Roma that are Armenian words and vice versa. Like the word for bread is hats, and it's the same word in Roma as in Armenia. Who knows? <laughs> when we picked Romania. <laughs> However, uh, when I go to Armenia in two weeks, um, and then next uh, in fall, we are now, we do have the data. And we are now looking at it. And you know what? It's almost the same as Romania. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so we were right. We were right. So, country specificity is important. Now, it's very, very important that you know something else about FRAX. Um, that is, it's a competing risk tool. What do I mean by that? It's a 10-year slice of someone's life, not lifetime risk, and you have to balance that risk of a fracture against the risk of dying. And every country has different data with regard to longevity. <clears throat> um, if you're going to die before you are finished your 10-year period, you're not going to have a hip fracture. And taken to its extreme, if you're 100 years old and you have all the risk factors for a fracture, what will FRAX tell you? FRAX will tell you you don't have a risk, much of a risk of having a fracture over the next 10 years because you'll be dead. That's what it does. The FRAX tool takes competing risk of mortality. And mortality is age specific, of course, and is also um, country specific. A country like Korea, which has great longevity, uh, may have, you might actually get into a therapeutic uh, recommendation well into your 80s, while a country where longevity is much less, like Russia, for example, um, then you, the risk would be different. Than 2.5. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know about that because the risk is different. We haven't, the answer is yes, but I don't know how to make that adjustment. But the fact that we now have information for a given T score, the risk of a non vertebral fracture is much less. Uh, maybe we should, and maybe that's figured out in this anyway. We don't know because risk of fracture is less. So already the, China, the data in the Chinese log would give you a lower risk of fracture. So maybe that's already incorporated. But with the more recent information, I don't know. Maybe we could refine it even further. Okay. Um, what do you have at 11? <laughs>
Are you okay? You don't have anything. Uh, you have you have lunch. Uh, we, Nothing to worry. Oh, okay. You have some time. We'll go maybe a few more minutes. Okay. Um, so, when to use fracs, when not to use fracs. Um, osteopenia, of course. You know that really. That's what is going to tease out the people with osteopenia who are, are at risk, and those who aren't. Uh, and obviously, in people whose bone density we don't even know, uh, you can use fracs. Fracs works, but it's not as good. It's not as good as having bone density, but it does work without fracs. Now, uh, we were talking about this with this case. And I'm glad you brought it up. Because um, if the treatment is obvious, if the T-score is less than minus 2.5, why do you need fracs? Uh, if there's a prior fragility fracture, we define osteoporosis by the outcome of the disease. That is a fracture. Um, somebody who has a normal cholesterol and has a heart attack has coronary artery disease, right? Somebody who has a fracture and has, I don't care what the bone density is, that person has osteoporosis. Uh, so we would typically not use fracs. Now, this is not generally agreed to in other parts of the world. Like the Europeans, particularly the Brits, take issue with us. They say, no, 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 you shouldn't base your decision based on the T-score. You should do a frax, and it is true that in, uh, like uh, the patient that I mentioned just uh, uh, today, um, she didn't make the FRAX guidelines, but her lumbar spine T-score was minus three. Now there's another wrinkle here, because FRAX uses femoral neck. FRAX does not use any other site. So we have another problem with FRAX. We do not use FRAX in premenopausal women because we don't have the data. We do not use, we now do it in perimenopausal women though. We do not use FRAX in men under the age of 50. And we are not supposed to use FRAX in um, individuals who have been treated with um, pharmacological agents because that changes risk. Okay? Now, FRAX is great, but it is not perfect. I mentioned the lumbar spine is not considered. We have a woman with a T-score of minus 3.1, and she doesn't make FRAX. Is that because we haven't taken into account her lumbar spine? We do not consider the dose of glucocorticoids. We just say, are you on glucocorticoids? Ever. Ever history. We do not um, talk about other contributors to bone strength. We do not consider rate of bone loss, bone turnover markers. We don't consider it. Besides RA, we don't uh, consider any other uh, secondary causes. And even the FRAX box that says secondary causes, if you check off the secondary box and you put the bone density in, that box is dead. It, does not, it has no meaning. It only works if you take the bone density out and then the box checked secondary cause will have an influence on FRAX. So it's really RA as a separate secondary cause that is important. The FRAX does not pay much attention to all the other causes. And FRAX doesn't consider anything but 10-year risk. Doesn't consider lifetime risk. So let's um, adjust this a little bit. So we have uh, uh, information about the discrepancy between the lumbar spine and the femoral neck and how to make the adjustments. And this again comes from uh, Bill Leslie's Manitoba uh, cohort. And what they have determined is that for every rounded T-score difference of one unit, that is the difference between the lumbar spine and the femoral neck, you adjust the FRAX risk of a major osteoporotic fracture up or down by 10%. So here's the example. The femoral neck T-score is minus 1.5. The lumbar spine T-score is minus 3.5. So the discrepancy is two T-score units. If the major osteoporotic fra fracture risk by that femoral neck T-score is 18%, you have to adjust it upwards by 20%. 10% per unit. So you have to increase that risk by 18%, add 20% to the 18%, which would be 3.6%. So the risk now becomes 
And that puts you into the therapeutic group. It pushes you from 18% to 22%. So adjusting with a major discrepancy between lumbar spine and femoral neck may, uh, may have a big difference in terms of what, you'd, what your decision is uh, in terms of um, major osteoporotic fracture. Now, it's not going to affect the hip fracture because you're using the femoral neck as your uh, direct marker for uh, hip fracture risk. So you have to do this calculation yourself because um, it's not written in fracs. And glucocorticoids, we know it's the second most common, or the most so common secondary cause of osteoporosis. And we, we joke with our, with our rheumatology friends, they cause this disease. Thank God we don't use it in Cushing's because we know what we're doing. Okay, so here's the adjustment. Uh, glucocorticoids, this is from the database in the UK. Um, uh, fracture risk, uh, again, a large database, Von Sta was the one who came up with this. So for people who are between 2.5 and 7.5 milligrams, we use the unadjusted FRAX model. You don't adjust for glucocorticoid dose. But if they're on a higher dose, more than 7.5 milligrams, you adjust the risk upward by 15%, whatever that risk is, for a major osteoporotic fracture and by 20% for a hip fracture. There is a sl much smaller adjustment for people who are on minimal doses of prednisone. I don't remember what it is, but it's some small, you, you can adjust downward. But the big thing is to adjust upward in people who are on chronic higher doses than 7.5 milligrams of prednisolone or the equivalent. So we have adjustments for lumbar spine uh, discrepancies. We have adjustments for amount of glucocorticoids. And we have yet another adjustment. Uh, the trabecular bone score is an imaging modality that you can uh, utilize by your DEXA image. Um, it does not require anything more fancy than um, buying the software package that loads the TBS score onto your DEXA machine. And the idea of the TBS is as follows. If you take on the left uh, a forest canopy, that's healthy, um, you see a carpet of trees that are beautiful, homogeneous. You can't tell one tree from another. On the right is a forest that has been cleared, forest fire, what have you, and there are clearings. And there's a heterogeneity uh, to this disordered forest canopy. And the analogy is the bone. On the left, very nice trabecular architecture. On the right, a lot of holes, a lot of clearings. And a textural analysis of the DEXA image can distinguish between the left and the right. So you can sort of get at this qualitative aspect of microstructure by a image um, uh, analysis. And the image analysis is in tertiles, unfortunately. It's a semi-quantitative. You can say it's in the top tertile. That means you're fine. You can be in the middle tertile and you're, the way that Didier Hans uses the term, you're partially degraded. And in the lowest tertile, you're fully degraded. And yet, this has become a very important point because it is an independent risk factor for fracture. So on this axis, you have the T-score, normal osteopenia, osteoporosis, and on the tertile axis, you have the TBS. So as the tertile goes down, independent of the T-score, graft fracture risk goes up. If you have osteoporosis in the back and a lowest degraded tertile in the way back on the left, you have a combined increased risk over and above the TBS uh, alone or the bone density alone. Okay? So this uh, also feeds into FRAX. If you do FRAX um, alone, low, moderate, high risk gives you an increasing risk of fracture. Here's the TBS tertiles, 
down, worse, worse. And together, if you add the TBS data in with the FRAX score, you have a greater predictive power. So TBS can be used also <coughs> to adjust FRAX. TBS is giving us information that DEXA isn't, and all the other FRAX risk factors are not. And as of, I think, last year, around now, you can get this, if you have TBS in your DEXA, and you do your FRAX, it will ask you, if you have a TBS value, click here. So you click there, you put in your TBS value, it's a scaled value, and your FRAX score will change. So, so that's pretty good. So we have FRAX. FRAX is FDA approved as of September, hmm, gee, 2014, I believe. Uh, FRAX doesn't yet have an ICD code, so you can't bill for TBS. You can't get your money back. It's going to cost you $10,000 for the software package to install uh, the TBS software. Uh, and it's a lost leader in a way because you can't charge for the TBS, at least not yet. Okay, so just a few more things. Um, why is FRAX not per perfect? Well, we haven't talked about bone turnover. Now we are adjusting for lumbar spine. We're adjusting for the blood corticoid. Maybe bone strength, maybe the TBS is getting at that. Um, the rate of bone loss, secondary cause is still a problem. And long-term risk is not considered. And finally, fall risk. I don't know if you've seen this picture of mine, which I think is really great. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about. This is an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> and uh, it, it, actually, this comes from Mike Lewicki. I don't know if this was staged. or <laughs> So it's quite amazing, isn't it? But it, it dramatically makes the point to try to minimize fall <laughs> risk. 